I've played through as Divine Hearts because you have no time to game. So you know how if you're driving down the road and you see some sort of incident going on in front of you and even though you should be focused on driving you just find yourself slowing down a bit and just kind of staring at what's happening that kind of staring at the car crash mentality I know they don't have the best of reputations, but I just kind of need to know what's going on. It's just been nagging at me. So I finally grabbed one of their games, and the one I grabbed was As Divine Hearts, which is an interesting name. Before we can actually look at the game, we need to look at the company first, Kemco. Who are they? Well, Kemco is an old Japanese company that's been around since 1984 and was a small department in an even older, larger company called Kotobuki Engineering Manufacturing Company, which if you think about it, is what they used to make the name Kemco. The K-E-M um, from the first three words, and Ko from company. So Kemco was more of a nickname, with the actual name being Kotobuki Systems. And in 2004, uh, Kotobuki Systems split off from uh, the manufacturing company and became their own thing so, and if we go back to the 1984 Kemco were actually developers mostly focused around the NES um, but now they're more a publisher for other smaller companies and it's as this publisher that we focus on them because that's pretty much all they do these days and them being a publisher and not a developer is kind of a key point as all Kemco games are put under the same sort of umbrella and judged in the same light, when in fact it's multiple devs, they are all have a very different style and focus when they're making their games. So the developers in question this time are EXE Create or X Create, however you want to say it, and they are one of the more prolific devs. Um, EXE Create are probably the company that gives it the it's just another shitty RPG maker game reputation even though that none of the devs under Kemco actually use RPG Maker uh, and they all seem to have their own in-house engine. Anyway, after looking around a few areas on the internet that Kemco fans actually appear, it seems even among the niche fans of, of Kemco, X-Create or EXE create are seen as very hit and miss with a few hidden gems and a load of unpolished dog turds. So, which is As Divine Hearts, I hear you gesticulate. Well, as with a lot of Kemco games, it was originally a made-for-mobile JRPG. Oh shit, don't go, don't go, it's not, it's not all bad. Um, yes, it has since been released on everything. Like, having its original release in 2014, and honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if there was a version for fridges out there somewhere. The version I played was the digital version for the Switch. There is a physical version out there as well, for those who are so inclined, but it's part of a multi-pack, so you, you have to deal with having other Kemco games on it, as Kemco games don't often get a physical treatment. So, looking at the game, the game follows our main protagonist, the childhood friend Zach, a pineapple-haired Chad, an overall good guy, and Stella, who has a serious girls next door vibes with a wit problem. Uh, these two children slash adults, because I never quite figured out their ages, are fellows of the kingdom of Guntenberg's orphanage. And while out returning a wild cat, they help Nurse back to health, just to reinforce how good they are, the cat is possessed by the so-called light deity. Off they go on their merry way to aid the light deity against the shadow deity knocked, picking up two more characters in their travels for good measure. And you know, this is literally a saving the cat to killing God storyline, like like literally. Uh, the story overall, while being quite generic, is held together somewhat by the rogues galaxy that make up the party, as they are quite a charming group, if a little stereotypical, and it's this group's dynamic that really makes the generic story shine a bit, a bit. When I say the story is generic, it's a typical save the world golden era story you're used to from like the SNES era 
without much in the way of twists or wrinkles. I mean, there's a little bit about knocked reasons, but other than that, yeah, it's it's really stereotypical. The gameplay, on the other hand, is actually pretty good. If the average person was asked what a JRPG was, they would probably have something in their heads that looks a bit like early Final Fantasy and turn-based combat. And well, this game just so happens to be a typical turn-based jank with a twist. The twist in this being a 3x3 grid-based system, with your side having formations that affect the damage input and output, um, and your enemies having a line-based system on the 3x3 grid, meaning outside of special abilities, you kind of have to start from the front and work your way back. So yeah, you, you're both set on these like these grids, and it's that's the twist, you're not just a line. Like, <laughs> I'm lining up on this side, you're lining up on that side. And the actual like the actual battle system from there on is pretty simple. So it's a speed-based turn order, which you can see at the top of the screen. Uh, this can be affected by your skills and magic. Your skills and magic have in their own stats, along with HP, so you have MP and it regenerating SP for your skills. Uh, it does actually lend to a bit of variety in what the characters do and their play types. Uh, you also have a super attack meter that slowly builds up. And, well, I just recommend saving it for bosses, as it's pretty powerful. But beware, each character has a different ability, and trying to find the one you like is part of it, so you'll probably have to give it a go five times. But there is one that stands out above them all, and I'll let you figure that out for yourselves. Because I don't want to spoil everything. Um, magic is actually divided into three distinct branches. Uh, so you, instead of your usual fire, water, earth, elemental stuff, you have light and dark, and kind of like an unaligned style. So it's a little bit different. And when you have access to all three of the magics on one character, uh, they get an extra magic that's combined abilities of all three. All of these have their own kind of debuff, buff spells and damage attacks. Um, light magic has your heal as well, but dark magic has its own way of kind of healing a bit as well. Your little dudes also have skills, which each character have in their own unique set, help differentiate them. So like, Zacks are all about massive damage. Uh, Stella tends to be very good at dealing with aerial enemies, etc, etc. Then, on top of all of this, we have the break and overkill mechanics. Overkill is pretty simple. If you hit an enemy with a multi-hit attack, and one of the first hits, like, kills the enemy, every other bonus hit goes into overkill. And this gives you a bonus SP, and bonus XP, gold, etc. at the end of the battle. Uh, break is a random event when you use a skill or whatever that allows you to use them a bunch more. So if it was a magic, you could use a bunch more magic for free. If it was one of your skills, you use a bunch more skills for free. So it's really good for like taking out groups or um, bosses when it happens, and you tend to get an overkill from it. This all combines to produce a surprisingly strategic battle system on like normal difficulty and higher um, and I actually encountered a couple of game overs which are thankfully very forgiving they just literally let you restart the fight or just give up on the fight and go back to your save and if you have enough of one of the in-game currencies you can carry on as if it never happened and I'm not gonna lie the bosses at the end with all their random shenanigans gave me a real run for my money one left me wondering if I could actually win when it out healed the damage I could do but thankfully, with a bit of luck and not the smartest AI and actually using some of the buff and debuffs, which uh, I hadn't been using properly up until this point, I prevailed and was able to finish the game. There is also an auto battle feature, which is good for blitzing through low level encounters um, or just like, you know, when you're in an area that you know you can beat the enemy safely. And there's on top of that, there's the auto win option where basically if the enemy is so low leveled the battle starts they die you get the experience without having to do anything oh yeah uh should mention the encounters are a random nature so they are random encounters not enemies walking around on the map which i know is a detraction for some people but i love i love random encounters outside of battle you have the basic town world map dungeon layout of ye old games and serve serve it's serviceable with snappy movement, if a little janky. 
found myself getting stuck to random bits of terrain every now and again, or misaligning when trying to grab chests. But by the end of the game, I pretty much got over that. Um, it was a little bit annoying, but no deal breaker. And the random encounter rate is actually really forgiving. Uh, which I only found annoying when it actually wanted to grind, until I realised there was a way of forcing encounters, which is based on a feature we'll be talking about in a second. So the game itself, you don't actually have to grind, um, but I did because, you know, I have to have all the shinies from the shops. Uh, this was nothing to do with levels. I never really did to grind for levels. The, uh, the shops, as we've just mentioned, are actually really simple. There's an item, a weapon affair, which are obviously you buy your items, mostly healing, and you buy your weapons and armor. The oddity there being a synthesis shop, which is for merging gems, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, thinking about dungeons next, the designs here are very simple. They're just floors with no real puzzles beyond like a super simple ice puzzle a la Pokemon and a very simple art puzzle. And that's like the most complex bits. The other bit is there are hidden paths, which are usually given away by broken wall graphics or etc. Bits that yeah, the dungeons themselves are, are not complicated and tend to repeat a bit. Like, they're not the same layout, but the same visuals. So, yeah, we have the towns are serviceable, the dungeons are okay, if simple. The world map is probably the worst element. There's no encouragement for exploration, as everything opens up as you require it for the story. Um, and there's just, yeah, there's nothing to explore. It's just a little bit disappointing. And the amount of reuse of items across the map, even though you go, like, spoilers, you go to a different world at one point, it's still the same. Uh, yeah. You do get a couple of vehicles, though, to help with your travels, being the classic RPG staples of an airship and a boat, but not in the stereotypical order. You actually get the airship first, for reasons. Um, but the airship does have one weakness. It can only land on grass, <laughs> which is... Which is fine. With, with the how low the random encounter rate is, you can park half a mile away and get to the towns before you've had the battle. Uh, the vehicles are pretty much the most simple form you can think of, and nothing we haven't seen before. Like I was saying, I've mentioned it briefly a couple of times, the biggest wrinkle is something called the Rubik system, which is a kind of Tetris-like grid using gems or jewels, whatever you want to call them, that fill them out. Um, these give you access to your, like, your new magic types, stat buffs, uh, status defences. Um, it can force random encounters or stop random encounters. And these gems can be synthesised in the synthesis shop to get higher tier versions of them or get some interesting ones, like the sweet EXP gaining ones, where you take every step you take, you get an EXP, or 20% boost on your battle where you get like 20% boost to gold yeah, they're pretty cool it's pretty cool doesn't take much managing um, it's this is all like wrapped up in the fact that the characters themselves have a specific element so Zack is light so you'll need to give him the shadow jewel and the void jewel to give him access to the other two magics Stella is dark so you'll need the light and the void etc etc um, so you need to figure out how you want to lay it out. Uh, but yeah, this leads us all to the presentation. And, well, it ain't going to win any awards, let's say that. But the character portraits are pretty good. And a little bit of expression during conversation when they pop up. And the sprite work is, is alright. Like, it, it feels, as people have said, RPG Maker-ish. I still think it looks a little bit better than RPG Maker. But yes, yeah, it's what it is. Um, and all the effects and stuff are, are all right. Like, again, it's just nothing special. Um, so it's like no real positives, no real negatives to say towards it. And the music, honestly, nothing sticks in my head. Like I, I listened to it before doing this and still nothing sticks in my head. So it's, it's just there. <laughs> um, but before I give my final thoughts, let's have a quick look at what others think as well. And it ain't that much. There's like one critic review for the Switch and two user reviews. 
One I couldn't read because it wasn't in English. But the one user review I did read from Damien Fletch, uh, they seemed to really like it. And concluded with, overall, if you're in the market for a cheap snare style JRPG adventure that will surprise you with its endearing characters, surprising story and fluid battle system, you really can't go wrong with As Divine Hearts for your Switch. And you know, I kind of agree. I don't agree with his score, 9 out of 10. But yeah, if you're after that kind of snares area feel, it does have that. Um, but what does the one critic have to say? In this case, it being Nintendo Life. Content to iterate rather than innovate is the line from the conclusion that stands out. And this is definitely at the heart of the, this game. It's nothing revolutionary. It's just doing what's been done before in a nice, easy, digestible manner. Once you get over the Chemco brand and start to play it, you know what this game is and you, where it's going before you even get more. My personal thoughts though is the gameplay overall is actually quite solid. Um, if not a slightly above average turn-based system. Uh, with the Rubik system and the mixing of skills across the characters, it produces something that's quite a memorable system. Like, uh, even if the story itself isn't. I probably won't forget the characters anytime soon. Like, they're all right. Uh, it's actually, overall, quite surprised me with how much I enjoyed it. And I wanted to actually get to the end of it. Uh, and I did. <laughs> so it's one of that cases where it's slightly better than some of its parts. And overall, I'd say it's inoffensive and enjoyable. Like, you're not going to be, you're not going to hate it because there's not much to hate about it. It's enjoyable, but you're probably not going to remember it in the long run. Um, is it the greatest thing ever? No, but it can make you smile and give you some entertainment for a few hours. And strangely enough, it's actually really good on battery life for the Switch. Apparently exceeding the limits that they thought a game could do, which was apparently about six hours, you can get about seven hours on a playthrough of this. So that's something they did. Uh, there is one wrinkle to all of this, the actual time, like gameplay counter doesn't work, so I don't know how long I actually spent on the game to tell you. As if you leave your Switch in sleep mode, it doesn't stop counting. Like, what the hell? But yeah, overall, solid mid-tier game. If you have the difficulty options, if you want to blitz through it even quicker to see the multiple endings, so you just set it to easy, use some of the systems and you can get to see the multiple endings. So overall, my rating is give it a go.